Well, all right, here we are. Is once again, I welcome you to Pastor B's kitchen table. You know, this is the place we break it down, chop it up, put it back together again. Each week we come and we bring guests who are dealing with items related to family and we're dealing with political issues, or dealing with relationship issues. This is the place we try to keep it real. And I'm honored to have a guest today, Brother Steve Brown. Well, Steve, you say hello to the kitchen table guests. How are y'all? Uh, good to be here. Can't wait to visit with you about uh, about the some of the issues of the day. Amen. Amen. Well, but I've asked you to kind of step to the kitchen table uh, yeah. because you know it was last year that we met in, in a series of town hall gatherings, right. and you and, and you were one of the panelists. And that's during the time we were talking about George Floyd. We were talking about racial injustice. Mm -hmm. We were on the streets. We were doing a myriad of things. We were talking about voting and voter right. legislation and voter suppression. We're talking about the presidency and a myriad of things. Well, here we are in 2021, and a lot of those things externally have changed. But, but I want to talk to you since you've been in, 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 in the hallowed hall of politics, you have run for Congress and all those kind of things. What now? Yes, sir, uh, Pastor. The what now question is really the question that um, should never leave our lips. We should always be thinking uh, proactively and forward thinking. And, uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to share with you today and, and discuss kind of, you know, what is next, what is now. Um, you know, what we saw in the results from the last election last November was, um, was what happens when people um, are alerted to what's going on with politics, when, when folks understand um, the need to be involved, the need to be engaged, the need to be active, the need to be activists uh, in our political system. And so um, we go from being activists, engaged activists, to, to advocates. And, and, and there's a difference there because I believe that you know, activism is something that you do to draw attention to an issue. Uh, advocacy is when you work within those institutions to make change. And so I think the what's next for us is how do we transform our activism uh, into advocacy? And what tools are in place, what resources are in place, or what, what are needed in order for us to be good advocates, good citizen advocates? Because what we find is that the moment that we've stopped the activism mm -hmm. and we wait for the next big issue to be activists again, all the time in between, we've lost ground. And, and, and let me, if you will, I'll give you a quick example of what I mean by that. Um, in 2008, we had the opportunity to elect the first black president. And, and we did. We were, you know, everyone was engaged, we were active, we went and voted, and that was all good, right? The concern, though, for folks who were fearful uh, of a black president and a progressive agenda was that um, we have to now do what we can to make sure that we prevent those voters from picking our leaders. And by those voters, I mean us, you and me, right? And in your congregation, um, there are people who look at us and say, we gotta make sure that they don't pick the leaders, yeah. right? They don't set the agenda. And so what they did was that in 2000, and in uh, 2009, um, they went to the legislature and they said, you know what, uh, we gotta, we're gonna have to go in and redistrict the districts. Uh, we wanna make sure that we gerrymander the districts in a way that will prevent or dilute the voting strength mm -hmm. of the folks who we don't want to have power in the system, right? So 2009 comes, and then a census comes out in 2010, right? And then with that census, that census is able to speak to the legislatures across the country how, where the people are and how to divide the people up into districts. And so in 2011, they were able to gerrymander the districts in such a way, uh, in such an extremely partisan way, that it really had the effect of empowering a minority of voters, um, not only at the state level, but also at the national level. Um, when Republicans took back over to Congress after redistricting, they literally received fewer votes 
the Democrats, but yet they got more seats, yeah. right? And you can do that by redistricting. And so my point here is that if history is a, is a tool for us to, to learn from, what we will see is that when we stop being activists and, and we don't transition that into advocacy, yeah. we allow for them to shape the rules in such a way that they can hold power over us um, despite the fact that there are fewer of them. Yeah. And I see that happening uh, this coming legislative session in Texas with redistricting. There will be redistricting this year. Uh, it may not be during the regular session. There'll probably be a special session this summer where they tackle redistricting. But guess what? Republicans, you know, and I, I know this is a nonpartisan thing, but I'm, I'm, just, I'm just telling you, you know, the fact that one party is trying to suppress the vote right. and the other party is trying to expand the vote, right? And so the party that's trying to suppress the vote uh, has a majority in the House and the Senate. They have the lieutenant governor, they have the governor, right? And so they're able to shape the map in a way that they can hold power despite the fact that there are fewer of them in this state. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm glad you're saying that because that's been my concerns. I've been watching the news and what's been going on, especially here in, in the great state of Texas, is that there seems to be a little, what I call somewhat of a draconian uh, Jim Crow 2.0 going on. Because as I, see, as I see our governor making trips all around, he's been to Houston several times now, talking about re redesigning uh, who can vote when they can vote, and still alluding to allegations that there was illegal vote, yet all tests have proven, all courts have proven, that in fact there, have, there was not any type of, of illegal vote casting going on. And yet there seemed to be an intention to say, well, we want to make sure that next cycle, I like how you phrased it, that the next cycle, that these groups of people cannot select our leaders. And so now, so we are now streamlining, we are reducing not only who can vote, but where you can vote and when you can vote. And that yeah. seems to be an intentional tactic. And my concern is that there are people maybe watching online that they're right. celebrating, you know, what's happening on the national level, right. and they're missing what's transpiring on the local level. Right, right. And, and it's really the local level that is, is of most concern because, um, what happened back in the mid 2020s, uh, I guess, I don't know how, how that's phrased, but you know, around the 2014, 2015, 2016 timeframe, um, the Supreme Court had, a, the US Supreme Court had an opportunity to, um, uh, to, uh, to strengthen the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Um, and what it did is said that in essence, um, really quite frankly, you know, astoundingly, they basically said, hey, you know, black folk elected a black president. So do we really need the Voting Rights Act anymore? I mean, that was, to paraphrase, you know, the, the ruling, that was essentially it, was that, hey, we don't need it anymore because you guys elected a black president. So that proves that it's antiquated. And until Congress fixes the criteria for states to have to abide by, in order to make voting changes, yeah. then the Voting Rights Act is basically null and void. Yeah. And so what you're saying is that that is the case because we live in a world now where the states don't have any oversight by the federal government when it makes electoral changes. So before, Texas was a pre-clearance state, okay? So what that means is that before Texas can make any changes to voting rules, it would have to be pre-cleared by federal courts or the attorney general. Mm -hmm. Because the Supreme Court ruled that the criteria that Congress used in 1965 to justify Texas being in pre-clearance, being a pre-clearance state, because those criteria were antiquated, Congress now has the burden of um, redeveloping or, or, or reinstituting new criteria and until they do that, Texas doesn't have to pre-clear anything with anybody. Yeah. And so Joe, Greg Abbott can now go around the state and say, hey, look, you know, um, we don't like it because you vote on Sundays. And so, you know, at the church, you do, you do souls to the polls. We don't like that. So we don't want you to vote on Sundays anymore. Well, guess what? He can do it now because he doesn't have to have it pre-cleared pre right. with 
you know, the new attorney general or, or the federal courts. And so, you know, what they did, what happened between 2010 and 2020 um, is a case study, yeah. not only in terms of Jim Crowism part two, yeah. but quite frankly, apartheid yeah. part two. Mm. The diminishing of our voting strength has been so broadly um, implemented throughout, throughout this country that it's really an amazement when anybody gets elected by black votes anymore. Black voters have to vote so much higher yeah. than we should have to in order to get the results electorally that we deserve. Yeah. yeah. And that's a shame. Yeah, wow. That's you know, I'm I'm glad you just put it as this thing, you put it where the goats can get it. And I appreciate that. Question for you. We saw you talk about activism and activists. Uh, we saw a lot of our young people who registered to vote, they went and voted. We saw a lot of our young people who took to the streets. So a lot of our young people who were at their campuses, they were making bold statements. They were sending up the level of, of levels of leadership and they were vocal and they were doing it. Now, what shift would you recommend for them? Because it's almost like many were saying, well, we need a new mountain to climb. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What, what's your word? How do they make the transition from being activist to activism? Yeah, yeah, you know, the, you know, you go to a point where you, you transition from the electoral cycle to the policy making process. Right. And in Texas, that policy making process started uh, last January and will end on May 31st. That, that's when the legislature gets together to um, meet and uh, once every two years, 140 days, mm -hmm. the legislature meets to write new bills for the state. Right, and then they'll go home for a year and a half and come back in uh, 2023, okay? Um, so now is when the act activism um, helps to set the table, help to set the agenda. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it tells legislators what's important to the, to what the community thinks is important, yeah. and that those legislators um, are now supposed to go to the legislature and say, you know, we heard from our constituents over the last year that, you know, bail reform is important, that, um, you know, making sure that police are um, equipped to, to de-escalate situations as opposed to, you know, being the ones with the fast trigger uh, and, and killing um, black men and women, brown men, men and women, um, you know, before they had an opportunity to, uh, to bring them in safely. Um, you know, we heard these things loud and clear over the last year. Now we're going to file legislation to make some corrections. Okay, and so um, and, and not just with, with you know police reform um, on a number of issues, whether it's the education achievement gap, the academic achievement gap, whether it's healthcare, whether it's environmental justice, you know, what have you. Um, there are opportunities now in the legislature where folks are. are starting to hear bills and the, the committee hearing process has started. And so to answer your question, you know, what do you do if you're a lay person and, and you want to be more involved, you want to be a better advocate? Wow. I will say first, um, this session is, is going to be challenging just because of COVID and the pandemic and some of the restrictions of access uh, to the process, right? And so before I will tell you to organize, um, identify bills that have been filed, um, and uh, you can you can Google um, you can Google the uh, state capital Texas state capital, um, and you'll be able to pull up uh, a website that allows you to to search bills based on subject er subject types uh, and issue areas. You'll be able to search bills based on the um, you know what your member, uh, your your house, uh, your representative, or your state senator, what bills they filed. Uh, and look at those bills and, and, and judge to see if those are the bills that you told them about, quite right. frankly, you know, regardless if you voted for them or not, they, they don't have to know if you voted for them. That's not their business. Uh, you are a constituent. You live in their district, you're a constituent. And so you have the right to say, hey, look, you filed 35 bills and none of these bills are applicable to me, right? right? I wanted you to file a bill that did this, this, and this. And you can call their offices and you can say, Good. hey, look, I looked at the bills, 
state representative, such and such. Um, I live in your district, I'm a constituent. Um, where is your bill on police reform? Where is your bill on closing the academic achievement? Okay. Where is your bill on environmental justice? These are the things that are important to me. And if you did not file those bills, I want to ask that you sign on to a bill that does those things. Mm -hmm. I want you to be a co-author now, right? And so what that does is that, one, it makes sure that it, it ensures that they know that we're paying attention, right? right? Mm -hmm. Particularly the folks who represent you, you know, that, that, you know, that I cannot stress that enough. You know, it's one thing to support somebody from a different district who's doing good things, right? And that's great. Right. Um, but when representatives and state senators and even members of Congress, when they hear from people who live in their districts and they say, look, you didn't file the bills that I needed you to file, but yet I still want you to support those bills. Yeah. I'm going to be watching to see what you do when those bills come on the House floor or come in your committee. And, and then, you know, we'll have to have continuing conversations. And the key to advocacy success is constant conversations, constant dialogue, constant engagement. And I know that we're all working, uh, Pastor, um, you know, nine, five, five days a week, sometimes even longer. And so, you know, we're not paid to lobby uh, on issues. And so we have to be able to identify organizations that can help okay. get that message as well. You know, that may be a fraternity or sorority, maybe the NAACP, it may be the Urban League, it may be, um, you know, a ministerial committee yeah. as well um, that, that, that can be focused on the, the legislative session and making sure that they, they're advocates uh, for, their, for their members that way. Well, you know, one other thing, if I could summarize what, you, what you're also almost saying is that you're talking about accountability. You, you're talking about that, that the old normative is that uh, we don't work for them, they work for us. And as such, there must be some built-in sense of accountability. And I think for many times, that's, that's been the approach. We, we, we vote someone in the office and we just like, you know, we'll, we'll see you going to Austin or going to DC and just do what you do. But the reality of it is that the thing we often miss is the part related to accountability. What exactly. And, 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 and so what, what we did was in, in the 60s, we were able to pass the Voting Rights Act, uh, Civil Rights Act. We're able to get districts drawn where we could send people who, uh, who look like us to those halls of power. Right. right? And that was great. Right. Um, what, we, what we have to evolve into, Pastor, is that uh, you look at, there's 150 members in the state house. There are 31 members in the state senate, including lieutenant governor. Uh, in the state house, you need 76 votes to get some of the facts in the state house. In the state senate, their rules are a little bit different. Uh, you need a two-thirds rule or a three-fourths rule, kind of depends on, you know, who's in charge. But you need about 20 or so votes consistently in the state senate, right? So what we did was we said, okay, well, 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 well they, they said, we're going to give you some districts. So that way, you know, We've done our job. You have your districts. You have your, you know, 15 or so black house members in the state house. You have your two black state senators. Mm. State senators, two, two black in, in the state. You only have two, right? And so I don't know what math um, folks are operating from, but 15 or so in the house when you need 76 votes to get something done. Yeah. Two in the Senate when you need 20 folks to get something done means that we're living in districts that aren't represented by those people, but yet the people who do represent us mm -hmm. should not be able to walk away from this fight. They should be held accountable yeah. and they should be helping those folks who are being, our, being at the vanguard of these issues in both of those chambers. Wow, that's awesome. If you would, Brown, say a word about midterms. Many times that eludes us, just flies right by us. Yeah, yeah. And, and it was the midterm elections that, that really set us back, um, you know, back in 2010, yeah. right? Because mm -hmm. that was when the, the Tea Party wave came about and, and they got, you know, they were fearful of a, quite frankly, of a black president. Mm -hmm. uh, they were fearful uh, that, that, that we were being empowered or we felt like we were empowered politically. And so they came out and voted. And the midterm election, they were able to reverse a lot of um, gains that have been made. And so um, 
what we tend to do is we tend to view things in terms of um, the presidential race every four years uh, as important. And even still with the presidential race, not enough of us vote in the, in the presidential primary as well. You know, a lot of us are still just voting in that November, every four years, that November, every four years. Um, what, we, what we aren't doing as successfully is we aren't voting in May elections. We have a May election coming up this May, a couple, in a couple of weeks, actually, um, which probably will be the most important thing, race that we will have for the next two years because it's an election for our school board members. Um, and maybe in some cases, I think there might be some elections for, for some city council members, uh, not in Missouri City, but in other, in other places in Fort Bend County. And so, you know, to your point, uh, Pastor Bobby, what, what I want to, to leave um, your audience with is um, our, we have a responsibility, not just to vote every four years in the presidential races, but we also have a responsibility to vote anytime there is a race on the ballot, which yeah. includes, yeah. Now, I used to joke that when I, when I was the party chair for the Democratic Party here in Fort Bend County, I used to joke that, um, you know, I swear Republicans would drive by their polling places every Saturday morning just to make sure they're not missing a vote, right? They're not missing an opportunity to vote. Right. You know, we need to, to, to have that same mindset. And, and it's a habit, you know, the, the, these are, these behaviors are habitual, right? And so it's a habit to not vote, but then again, it's a habit to vote as well. Yeah. And so we have to get to the process where we see voting as a habit and we are looking for opportunities to vote every single chance we get. Yeah, amen, amen. Okay, I thank you so much, Brown, for this time of sharing at Kitchen Table. You're probably wondering why is Pastor talking about politics today? Because I want you to be informed. I want you to be knowledgeable. I want you to understand what my brother said so eloquently, the difference between someone being an activist and activism and the importance of us keeping our, our nose to the grind and fighting on. Because that's it, the fight's not over. They're just try, simply trying to change the venue but the fight still rages on. We gotta be informed, we gotta be informed. Part of us being as people of God, we're, we're, we're involved in where we live. We gotta seek the welfare of the community and city we live in, and part of that is equality for everyone. And that's why I'm bringing this to you. That's why I'm bringing you guests like this, Brown. Brother, may God bless you, may God keep you. May you keep on fighting the good fight. Uh, kitchen table, tell your mother, tell your father, tell all your nymphs what you heard. Listen to this. Play it back. Show it to someone. Send it over to someone. But they may be informed that we may be wise in such a time as this. God bless you. God keep you. I'll see you next week right here at the kitchen table.